me here today because she carries so much in the Lord. You all are just going to be mesmerized by what she brings forth because she's going to bring it with power and the anointing that God has in her. So, Sheree, if you want to go ahead and come up. Oh, you're welcome. And I will, I'm letting them do their own bios because it was a lot for me to have to memorize for all, all of them. <laughs> so I'll let her introduce herself. Have a bio. Well, I kind of, I kind of, she says my own bio. I said, well, I, I kind of have a bio, but I don't, I don't really think about it that way. Uh, first, I want to, I want to say thank you to Faye for the, just the privilege to come alongside and to just have this opportunity to speak into your lives and to share the things that God has given to me. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I want to thank uh, Pastor and Shelly and, and Pastor Jason for opening up their house for this conference. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just a blessing to let uh, me come. I feel like I'm just, I don't know, kind of just coming alongside all these people that I know, you know, here at the house, so many of them and so many that I, that I knew ones that I'm getting to know, and it's just such a privilege. I'm just so excited with it. I want to open a little bit with the Word of God first. I want to just ask the blessing of the Lord on what I have to say. Father, in Jesus' name, I just I am just moved <laughs> with just joy and anticipation of what you have today for these ladies. Already you have begun a great and good work. And just thanking you, Father. And Lord, I ask you, Lord, to minister your life and your spirit through me today. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to honor also the worship team. Well done. Beautiful. I appreciate your words, even that you've said in between. They were life. They were life to me. Thank you. Anointing is really up on you. And I just want to thank you. And I want to thank Tammy for what she shared. And it just was just life. Thank you, Tammy. Um, it's really interesting about Tammy uh, and even Shelly. And... Um, uh, we served in Cleansing Stream together and knew each other together in ministry at HHC. And, and what's so neat about that is, is that my husband was scared spitless to be involved in Cleansing Stream. But he said, Shelly and Tammy can pray for me anytime. He said, those women know how to pray. <laughs> and that just for the, just the blessing of knowing these ladies. And we have a history together. We have a past together of things that we have shared and experienced together. <laughs> we've wept together. We've stood together. We've loved together. And we have a past. We have a history. Uh, this is my family, uh, taken uh, several years ago. Uh, my son is there on my right. and, and uh, Yeah, my right, next to his dad. And uh, Susan, they've been married uh, 30 years, and their two children are, are Madeline and John behind. On my left in the photo is uh, my daughter and son-in-law, and they've been married 25 years, and those, their children. So that is Olivia. I always wanted to go to Africa, did get to go on a trip to Africa, and I was one of those kids that, uh, when I share my testimony, that I wanted to go to Africa. And uh, so the Lord blessed me, but he told me, he said, I'm going to bring Africa to you. And so he has given us uh, uh, our Olivia from Ethiopia, and she's a joy to us. And, um, and then behind my daughter is her oldest daughter, uh, Andrea, and then there's Noah and Nathan. And you can tell this is a while ago because Nathan is now six feet tall and he's running in a, in a cross country conference today. And he's a tremendous athlete. And next to Nathan is John. And he is also an exceptional athlete at Center Grove. And then, then there's Madeline, our oldest granddaughter who is getting married, graduating in December this year from uh, IU and is going to be married in, um, in February. So we are, um, our family is growing and extending and just it's, they are, other than Jesus, my dearest loves in life, gifts from God, things that I'd never thought that I'd ever have. 
in life and so grateful. And I want to share a little bit about me and my Tim. Uh, we've been married 54 years last week. And uh, it's, it's a good thing. And we like each other. Now, we get kind of feisty with each other sometimes, but we like each other and we enjoy each other's company. Still, after so many years, it's a good thing because when I got married, I wasn't too sure about it. I, was, I wasn't sure it was going to last. And seriously, I was at the altar saying, well, if this doesn't work, I can always get a divorce. And I, I kind of, I didn't have a clue what God had in store for us. And lots and lots of good stuff, and it's been pretty amazing. I only brought one picture. I didn't even think about some of the things. Oh, my goodness, I should write a book of the things that God has done in my life. Uh, but I am that book. And I loved what you said about vessels of oil. You have no idea. We're hearing the voice of God. Um, you know, I just can't even, but I'll share later about how we are that vessel of oil, that vessel of honor. And I'll share with you privately, but you know, disappointments happen and I thought I missed God so badly it, uh, not too long ago but your word was an edification to me. You didn't miss, you're the oil. And I just thought, how precious. If you're listening, ladies, God is speaking. If you're listening, he's speaking to you in everyday life activities. He's speaking to you. It isn't always thus saith the Lord. It is the simple things and the simple ways that God speaks to us. He speaks to us out of the impossible. He speaks us to us through the crises of life. He speaks to us through the gentleness of a butterfly. He is an amazing, beautiful God. And he wants to talk with you. He wants to dialogue with you. He has something to say to you. No matter what your age is, no matter what your gender is, and by the way, you are either male or female. There's none of this in-between stuff. There is a God that is speaking to his people, and especially in these last days. I want to affirm even Tammy again. I have just come through a crisis of my own personal walk with the Lord, of not thinking I'm hearing God about the vessels of oil. And, and it really has stripped me, and I kept thinking, why am I not hearing the voice of God? Why am I in this place that I am? And it, and it was just a gentle reminder that there's going to be days ahead, ladies, that we're not going to necessarily hear his, pre hear his voice or sense the weight of his presence, but he is still with us, and we have to know that he is God with us. God with us. He is God with us. Never, he says, either his word is true or it's not. But I know that his word is true, and I am so not on my message today. But <laughs> I had to say that to you, Tammy, because it is so true. There are times that you will go through seasons, ladies, where you will not experience his presence, and you'll not hear his voice, but he's going to say, are you trusting me? Are you trusting me that I'm going to lead you and guide you into all truth according to what my word says? Not what you feel, not what you think, but that I am with you and walking with you. I have been in the ministry 42 years, and I got saved when I was nine years old. And then when I was nine years old and got saved, I was being molested. I had been molested by a girl, so that spirit of homosexuality was introduced into my life when I was four years old. And then I was repeatedly sexually violated and my innocence stolen from my, uh, a family member. A lot of stuff happened in my life. There was a lot of hurt and anger. Saw pornography continually. It was always before me. So what did God do? set me on a course of purity and holiness. Who would have thunk? Who would have thought such a thing? And so I first heard love was not something that I heard in my home. When the boy said, I love you, is only because he wanted, now this is real life, guys, I'm pretty real. But he wanted something from me. And when anybody touched me in an unholy way, that's what I thought love was. I had not a clue what real love was. I did not know. I didn't hear the word love. So to me, love was just a touch from a little boy wanting to do something to me. That is what my life was like for many years as a young girl. 
And yet there was still something within me that believed that there was goodness and there was God and there was something more than this. And yet I came up with guilt and shame and condemnation always in my life. And it still tries to visit. It still tries to war on me. You know, but I've come to a place of understanding that I belong to God, that I'm his. I am not what the devil says I am. I am who God says that I am. But it is, a, it is sometimes a battle. This is real life, guys. You know, it's real. I'm pretty real. I doubt like it pretty much is. And I want to share with you, though, that even though I was being sexually molested at the age of nine, God sent an, an older lady to me and told me that I was beautiful. I thought, I don't, I'm not beautiful. I never knew what beauty was. Beauty was always a violation of something. And so she invited me to come to church and hear the good news. I didn't know what good news was. But when I went to that Baptist church on the corner and I heard that Jesus loved me so much that he died on the cross for me, I ran to that altar because nobody loved me. Well, nobody loved me enough to die for me. And I had no, I didn't even know. And I knew that I wanted this Jesus. I wanted a savior. I needed a savior. At the age of nine years old, I knew I needed a savior. And I met him as my God. Now, I was still being molested. I was still being treated mis with abuse of words, not so much touch in the family dynamics of a mom and a stepmom and, a, and my, my dad, but there was still those loads of hurt and never good enough and not words of affirmation. But somehow, some way, I still believed Jesus loved me. And this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and I believed it in my heart. And so the abuse, the sexual abuse, the sexual molestation stopped when I was, um, got to be, he, he, it was a family member, my uncle, he was, uh, when I was 10, he was 14 and experiencing hormones. And, and one thing that you said is about understanding sin. When you've been there and you've done that and you walk through it and you forgive, you understand how it happens. You get it. And uh, so anyway, I, um, those next 20 years almost don't count, you know, because there was no Christians in the, my home, none in my family. Uh, words were still hurtful. Words were still negative. And yet there was still a call of God on my life. And I tell you, I know that there was a call of God on my life because when I look back, I see that the very things the enemy used to destroy me are the very things that I walk in. I didn't think I had a voice, and God uses my voice. I didn't think I had power to say no. I have power to say no. I didn't know that I had power to re be released from the bondages of sin and the things that the devil was putting upon me. I thought it was me, but that's how I know that I now have victory over those things because they were the very things the enemy tried to use to steal, to kill, and to destroy me. And so the next 20 years almost don't count drugs and all the things. I was in the 60s generation, so I did uh, drinking and smoking and chasing and partying and all the stuff that goes with the 60s generation. And I would go off and I would do things that I shouldn't do and things that I don't even like to talk about. And I would pray all the way home, God, why am I doing that? I don't like it. I don't know why I even do that. I needed deliverance. I didn't know I needed deliverance. I didn't know that was even offered to me. But I got deliverance. But in the meantime, I'm still praying and talking to God and getting married and having babies. And, and, and I'm thinking, you know, why do I do these things? And then uh, my husband was not saved and he was uh, an alcoholic, and, uh, which is now even a, a miracle to see. It's not there anymore, but just that. What? That's a miracle, you guys. I mean, you, you just don't know how much of a miracle our, our marriage is. And so... Um, in, uh, 19, in, in tw not 1929, although it feels like it was 1929, 
and, and when I was 29, God brought a young woman into my life, and I, um, I was smoking and drinking and chasing and partying, and married, but still smoking and drinking and chasing and partying. And so uh, she told me I needed, um, I ne she said, you need the Lord. And I, so I rededicated my life back to the Lord, and, I, and um, she said, you need the Holy Spirit. And I got a radical, a radical, I got loaded on Saturday night, and y'all know what loaded means, not drinking, I was loaded, and the other stuff that goes with it, and I um, got, but I, on Sunday night, I got on my knees before God, and I said, Lord, I, I can't get free from this stuff, I don't know what it is, and I started praying a prayer of a book that I never read, but I read the, prayed the title of the book, Lord Change Me by Evelyn Christensen. And I'd walk by and I'd see that book and I'd say, Lord, I give you permission to change me. I, Lord, I know I need change. You're going to have to change me. And that night, December or January 17th, I woke up. Je, je, that night I was visited by the Lord and then uh, I had a vision of the rapture of the church. And I woke up the next day on fire, delivered threw my cigarettes away, my speed away, my marijuana away, uh, my pornography away. I threw it all away. And, um, and, and I was on fire for, for God. Now, did I, and I said, oh God, is this your Holy Spirit on me? And he spoke to me and he called me as a watchman on the wall. I didn't know what that was. There's was no teachings out there at all about it. Uh, and he said, uh, told me that I would have great heartache, which has been true. And, you know, yes, there is joy in the Lord, and yes, the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. But when you are a watchman and you have a great empathy gift, you will sorrow and mourn with the people. And you will weep with them that weep. You will mourn with them that mourn. But you will rejoice with them that joy in the things of God. So I uh, became um, filled with the Holy Spirit at 29, on fire, and he was still drinking. It was light and darkness together, but nevertheless, God still, he told me, he said, you can leave if you want to, but he said, if you stay with him, I'll give you your husband. And I said, but I don't like him very well. And I, he says, he said, that's okay. I do. And he says, but if you stay and you fight for him, you'll win him to me. And so, and he showed me, he said, nobody can fight for your husband like you can. Not even his mom, not a brother or a sister, but a wife because I'm in covenant with him. This is so not my message. <laughs> but it, it must be what you need to hear. Because ladies, there are some things worth fighting for. And especially a man, even if he's your man and he's drunk, he is still worth fighting for. He's worth fighting for. But God had to do a lot of change in my heart. And he said, this is so not my message. <laughs> But uh, how long do I have? 44 minutes. Oh, Lord, I got to hurry. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I said, well, you're going to have to teach me how to love him because I didn't know what love was. Remember all the bad stuff. So he taught me that love was not a feeling. Love was not sex. That's all just part of it. But he says, love is a choice. Will you love him? Will you prefer good him for him? Will you prefer him to others? Will you set him in a place of honor? Will you respect him? If you do these things, you will love him. Do you will him good? Yes, Lord, I will him good. I really want you to get him good. <laughs> He said, will you love him? And I said, Lord, I choose to love. And so though that, those next few years were really, really hard, really hard. And we threatened divorce, walked through divorce, not, not didn't, but did. We, you know, but God said, I lost the diamond out of my ring. And he said, don't despair. I'm going to give you a new ring and a new diamond. He says, because I'm giving you a new marriage. And so that's that diamond right there. And then in 25 years, he had that remounted, and this is the 50-year anniversary ring. And um, there is something of, of, it's worth it if you stay and pay the price. It's worth it. But you have to hear from the Lord. You have to hear. And he began to walk me through a, a life of learning what real love was. That love isn't what the world throws at you, ladies. It is that commercial of changing diapers and cleaning up throw up. That's love. That honest, that's love. It's cleaning the toilets. That's love. Uh, those are the things that, that God would have us to call to learn to do. Remember, he said that he was the servant of all.
And when you begin to serve your husband and serve others, then love is becoming perfected in you. God is perfecting love in you. So I, I didn't get to go to Bible school, or I mean, I didn't get to do some of the things I wanted to do in life, but the Lord took me on a journey, and I was in the school of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and and, and I, I am ordained, I am licensed, I have had many, many ministry opportunities in life. I loved hearing the things that God did, has done in Tammy's life, and we've We've had some wild and crazy things, uh, uh, too, and I just, I stand back and go, who was that woman? You know, who in the world? But I want to encourage you in the message of, of the word of the Lord today. I do have a message from God. I feel like that he has given me some scriptures, some things to share with you, and, and um, I, 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 I delight in it. You see this picture right here? We're going to talk about some ladies in the Bible today. And it's really neat. I love the theme that, that uh, Faye had for, uh, that God has given to her about um, in, in spirit and in truth, but then to encounter. Once you have encountered Jesus, once you have actually spent time with him, there is nothing like it. Not, there is nothing. You can go through form, for a formality. You can play church. You can have a religion. But when you have really met Jesus... There is nothing. There is nothing. I love the song we sang this morning. There is nothing like Jesus. Nothing like being in love with him. Nothing. Nothing's better. I mean, I can pause and think of the times that his presence has come so thick. And I, I would say, Lord, I got to go. But I don't want to go. I want to be here with you. He's so wonderful. Most of us here today know the story of the woman caught in adultery. I was caught in adultery. I was caught. And, uh, and I was saved. I didn't know, uh, again, how to get free from that power that was over me. I needed deliverance from a sensual spirit that was introduced to me at four. And uh, I needed freedom, but I didn't know how to get free but when I encountered him. I did. He began to show me and teach me. So, what happened in that day? They drug the woman away that was caught in the act of adultery. This hangs in my home. And I look at it from time to time and remember. And um, my, my sin was exposed publicly. There were things that happened that I'm not proud of. And then I encountered the Lord. And he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. That's why he has given me an anointing even to minister to women. I get it. I get it. And to men. I get it. I know how the enemy seduces. I know how he comes and tries to crush you and kill you. I know how it happens. And he sees the call of God on people's lives. He sees where you are. He sees who it belongs to God. And if he can try to destroy you before you walk in the fullness of that call, he'll do it. And it's always, I always marvel at this story because where's the man? It was against, you know, where is he? You know, and we live, we as women, especially preaching women, which I am, I, I am a preaching woman, and we tend to think that we were a second thought. And the world tries to put that on us. That's why, even if you will, that I can have a level of compassion for some of the women in the world because they're fighting for our freedom and they're just going about it the wrong way. And the truth is that a woman is not a second thought to God. She's not an afterthought. She was always in the heart and the mind of God. I love what you said, Tammy, when you said that the Holy Spirit is the nurture. I love that. I said, Lord, I just need your nurturing. <laughs> because I didn't have a mama that nurtured, you know. And I just, oh, I love that. I said, and I love the Holy Spirit. I love that encounter that I've had with the Holy Spirit. I have had encounters with the Father, the Father's heart. 
his healing, his comfort. My dad and I were close. He had great big hands, and he was a big man, an athlete, and just a marvelous person. He was a, also had lots and lots of stuff in life. And, but those stuff didn't matter with, with me, really. They didn't. They never did. I always just saw him as, the, the, I think, the way the Lord wanted me to see them, see him. But there was absence of mother, but God was faithful to bring nurturing women Pay attention to the women that God has brought into your life. Pay attention and look at the gifts and the call. Thank you, Faith, for the kind words that you said over me. God brought me into her life. And, and I treasured her because she was one of my girls. You know, I, God had given me many young women to mother. I wanted a bunch of kids. I only had two. But God brought these young women into my life. <laughs> there, Shelly. She was a teenager when I met her. And these girls, watching them grow and mature and become women of God, women of integrity, women of value, women of worth, women that have substance, women that walk in holiness and do not compromise that. Oh, ladies, I tell you what, I believe that there is coming an anointing upon women, a godly anointing, that when you walk into the room, you're walking and carrying in the manifest presence of God, and people will pause and turn and look and not go, wow, woman, but they're going to go, wow, woman. What you carry in is the gift of God that is upon you. It doesn't mean that a man is a lesser than, and it doesn't mean that you're over him. I am a very submitted woman. Y'all, those that know me know that I am subjected to my husband. I'll yield to him over and over and over and over and over again. But because of that, the Lord has elevated me with power and authority to walk in. He has trusted me with the authority because he knows I will subject it first to my husband and then to my pastor if God calls me to do something. I am a submitted woman to authority. I know what authority is, therefore I have the right to carry it. So I want to tell you a little bit about another woman. I have 35 minutes. Oh boy. Okay. I want you to, if you don't have your Bible, whoops, that's all right. We're going to ad lib it a little bit. Turn to, this is the, what I feel like that the Lord has given to me. This is the message of the Lord. Now I wanted to share my testimony. And I wanted to share some of those things because that's where you guys are. That's where you're coming from. You understand uh, what it's like to be used up. Do you feel like that sometimes? Have you just been beat up, used up, stripped everything from the world? You have been because that's what the enemy does. He steals. He's a thief. And if he can get you, he'll try to any way that he can. And I want, But I know that I want to share with you that you have a value and a worth. And again, it dovetails into Tammy's message. The value and the worth of woman. I, I felt like I was nothing. I did everything. that it, I let people do things to me because I didn't know I, I couldn't. I could say no. I didn't know that. And I had the fear of man in my life. A lot of, a lot of stuff. And this scripture verse God gave to me early on in my spirit walk with him. It is Luke 8, no, excuse me, Luke 7, 36. And I'm going to read it to you and then I'm going to talk a few minutes about it and move into the conclusion then. It says, now one of the Pharisees was re requested him, Jesus, to come and dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. I love that. He was, Jesus was at ease at the table with the Pharisees. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't bother him. And it says, and behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. There you go. She, her reputation preceded her. That doesn't tell us what kind of a sinner she was. She could have been a thief. She could have been a prostitute. She could have been a shady character. She could have been, maybe she killed her husband even, accidentally. Who knows what, what her sin was. But she had a reputation. She was a sinner. She was labeled. Do you ever feel like that sometimes in your past that you have a label over you? Victim, 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 inviting evil spirits to come and beat you up? I mean, that's real life, guys, because sometimes I feel that way. And nevertheless, I've overcome and when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. I'm going to pause here for just a minute. 
I've looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked some more for an alabaster vial. I do not have one. I have an alabaster box, and some of your translations might even say box. Alabaster is a very delicate and, and yet um, an exceptional stone. They use it today, which I think is really neat, to uh, polish uh, light shades and hang over the lights, and they, their luminous is um, kind of um, just refreshing and easy and calm and healing. Uh, but I've had this box for a long time, and uh, so this is, this is alabaster. And so you can see pure alabaster is white, has some yellow veinings in it. It's not heavy like marble. It's delicate. But I looked for alabaster and a vial. I've been looking, couldn't find one anywhere. But when they say that they broke the alabaster box, they didn't literally probably break the, the vial. But what they would do is you see this ancient piece here. This is ancient, and when I say ancient, this is turn of the century, 1900. So anywhere from 18 to, to um, turn of the century, around 1900. <clears throat> they would take and they would press the oils for perfume, and they would put them in these vial bottles like this, and then they would seal it with a cap of wax. And so this is, the, in this neat, you got, guys, I just love it. And so, uh, and so I was stupid, though and I broke the seal that was on this one and uh, didn't know. But if you come, you can still smell even the rose oil that was in there. And I have another one at home, that you, that is, but I didn't want to transport it because I was afraid it would leak. Out. And, um, but you can see very old. The markings on it is very old. And I, so I want you to see that what they probably did in the alabaster vial had, pro, had a dipping of wax on it. And so they would break the seal so that the fragrance of the, uh, the ointment, which in this case was nard or uh, frankincense, no, she, I did a study on I did a study on all these. I did a study on frankincense and nard and all that uh, to refresh myself in it. But it was spike nard that was in this this um, alabaster box. Um, vial it says so she brought an alabaster vial of perfume another thing of interest in this this is so good i love this L listen up ladies this is all she had she brought her best this was probably even her dowry at, for her her wedding that she would bring into the wedding covenant the marriage covenant it was so precious and so valuable it was probably something that was handed down to her maybe even from her parents it was a, such a treasured vessel it was something that 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 nowadays would be valued at, I read one article, up to $10,000, the uh, price of the ointment on the inside of, of it. This is a prophetic picture of us, and, uh, and you'll see as we go on that even though the seal of, of innocence may have been broken, even though things have been stolen away from your life, what is within you is priceless. What that is in, invested in you, the spirit life within you, the life that, is, that Jesus gave everything for you is within you, the value and the worth. It is who you are. This is the outer. This is the outer court, if you will. And then there's the soul, the inner court. And then there's the spirit, the inner court, the secret place. That which is within is the value. Praise you, Lord. And it says again in verse 38, And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair of, of, on her head. Even the, to do that, what courage it took for this woman to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. First to lay down her hair. Only the women in the world would lay down their hair and allow their hair to be exposed. But she was so vulnerable. She was, she, she was so abandoned to the Lord that she 
came to him and she wept at his feet who was going to make the journey to the cross and his feet would be pierced with a nail and that is even a picture of God for us. He knows our walk. He knows what we've been through, but he paid the price so that you could be healed in your walk. Jesus paid it all for you. So loved are you, women. So loved are you. And I, I know the wrestling of being, could you really love me? Could do you really? Honest, this is real life. Do you feel like that? I know even the gentlemen that are here. Sometimes you could say, well, well could you really love me for what I have done? And he says, yes, I love you. I love that secret thing that Tammy did. I learned from that, that she sat with her grandchildren. Close your eyes and ask Jesus, do you love me? Don't you wonder sometimes when you even mess up, you, you still love me? I still love you, says Lord. I still love you. I'm sorry, I'm squishy in my eyes. My eyes leak. Thank you. I don't know why. I stopped wearing eye makeup after I got the baptism in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> because I cried all the time. And I didn't realize. I thought it was a curse. And they used to make fun of me when I, when I was a kid because I'd be so sensitive, oh, so brokenhearted. And they would say to me, stop wearing your heart on your shoulder and get over it. And I would go, how do you get over it? You know, when, when you see an animal hit by a car and you cry? Because you have compassion. I did not know that that was a gift because they told me to stop it and grow up and stop being so sensitive. And I've come to see that my sensitivity and the empathy is, is God-given. I didn't know it was and that my tears are not wasted, but they're valuable. <laughs> they're, not, they're not wasted. Women of God. Every tear is bottled. Every tear is precious. I didn't know that, but they are. He kept wiping them. She kept wiping his feet with her hair and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Can you see it in your mind's eye? I love this story. <laughs> It says, and now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Ladies, there are those that form opinion against you everywhere you go. There's people you may even be living with. How about 25 minutes? Living with that may form judgments against you. Family members that might not see the value and the worth that you are. They will point and, and, and accuse. You, you know what? I told a friend yesterday, I said, I do not need the devil. I accuse myself enough. You know, I mean, that's how, I mean, I feel like, who needs the devil when you, you know, because... Because uh, of excellence that God has put in my heart, I didn't know that, the, that I was always wanting excellence and the best. It was because he put that there. And, and, and so <coughs> it was what he invested in me that I have to, had to learn to value, that the sensitivity and the desire to do good was something that he invested in me and that it was okay. And even though things flaw, are flawed and mess up, even that's okay because he said, I want you to see the fallenness of this world, how things are, never do quite measure up. Because if, if we see that everything is perfect in this side of heaven, then we won't strive for more. We won't want more of him rather than, than more of the world. If we are so in love with the things of the world, we miss what God has for us. And so he allows things to not be perfect, you know. 
And so um, I've learned to, uh, well, I can't say I've learned to. I'm, I'm in process of learning to embrace my imperfections. You know, I still work at it. And I, you know, uh, guys, years. It, I, was, I was 15 minutes late this morning because I couldn't get my pantyhose on. And I was just pulling on them and stretching on them because I haven't worn them. And I don't wear hose, you know. And I just, I had to laugh on and I said, oh my gosh. You know, there's this over here and this over here. And it didn't used to be there because it had been that long since I wore pantyhose. And I thought, oh, what a funny thing. And I had to laugh. And, you know, and when you get to a certain age like me, you know, and I'm 72 now, and I can say it without stuttering, and <laughs> embracing my femininity and embracing my age. It is okay. I'm a mature woman of God. And God says, I, God said, I want them to see your fullness because you earned it. <laughs> and I often refer to it in the word of God that this is my mound of wheat. It's in the word of God. And embracing these things and, and rather than hating it, you know, I still exercise and I still run and do things. Well, I don't run, but I mean, <laughs> can't run. <laughs> no, not anymore. But I mean, I, it, I still fight the good fight of faith <laughs> and, and try to be better than I am. But it's, it's a battle. <laughs> and, and yet, on the flip side of it, it's okay that I'm a mother in the church now. It's all right. Instead of being the little girl, the young one in the church, and when everybody made fun of me, well, you know, when I was a, a young Timothy, now I'm a mama in the church, a grandmom. And I'm getting close to be a great grandma. <laughs> That's okay. It is what it is. I was sharing with... Uh, Mrs. Plummer about how how even in the maturing of our old age, God still uses women. He still uses us. And he, I got to had the privilege to speak at a women's conference in Florida a couple um, uh, some months ago. I don't remember when it was. And I had, see that goes with it. And I was telling him that the message that the Lord gave me was about Anna. Because you get to a certain age sometimes and you feel like God's done with you. No, he's just got, he's just got a few new things for you to do. He's still, you're still a vessel. You're st now is your assignment to pray. Maybe you're not out there running uh, track meets or you're not doing this or that anymore. But you still are on assignment with the Lord, even if it's in the ministry of intercession. And what better ministry to be in, because that's what Jesus is still doing. He's still seated at the right hand, and he's interceding for us now. So praise God. Okay, on with the message. <laughs> now when the Pharisee, he, and he said, he said he, would, he, he, he was actually even being critical of even Jesus, you know. And not, he appointed the finger to accuse the woman, but he was, he was criticizing and judging Jesus. And then Jesus answered. I love that. And Jesus answered his thoughts. Just like, just like the birdhouse. You just had a thought and there it was. <laughs> and so Jesus answered him and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. I love this. Jesus, he's so good. And he replied, say it, teacher. <laughs> I can only imagine. I wonder what he thought Jesus was going to say to him. And, and, and he said, a certain money lender had two debtors. One who owed him 500 denarii and another only 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them, therefore, will love him more? Simon answered and said, well, I can just see it. Well, I guess, I suppose, the one he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged, weighed, and discerned correctly. You've, you've weighed this correctly. And he said, and turning toward the woman, and notice that the woman did not respond. But listen to this. He said, and turning toward the woman, he said, so there's not one thing, ladies, that you do unto the Lord that goes unnoticed. Jesus notices. He knows this. He sees. He said, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. Remember that they wore sandals and they, they, the dust and the cares of the world were on their feet everywhere they went. And so when they would come into the house, it was, the, it, it was a courtesy to offer water 
to wipe it, the, their feet off and their hands to be cleansed from just the dust. And the, even that, oh man, I could stop and preach that, but I'm not going to. And it says, and but she was, uh, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. She was so vulnerable. She was so abandoned. She did not care what another thought. Not even this man of spiritual authority. Not even this man who was a leader, quote unquote, in the church. She abandoned all and wept at the Savior's feet. I want to pause and tell you a few times, many times, those that know me, know that I am an intercessor and, and that many times God will let me feel his heart for the people or, he'll, or I'll experience his, his heart for the people or their sin. There have been times that I have been on my face sobbing that I thought I was a sinner and I knew it wasn't my own tears I was shedding. I was in a place of intercession. And I have had in the past where I have lifted my skirt and blew my nose in my skirt be, because there was, ma'am, that is the truth, I did. There was no, no, uh, and I, even at somebody's house we know, Tina Foley's sister, I was, she asked me to come pray through her house, I come pray through her house, I start getting the burden of the Lord, and she said, all I have here is, is, a, is a towel, and so I took, I said, I'll take it home and wash it for you, but the, what I'm saying this is, is that when the Spirit of the Lord moves you, there is no shame to shed those tears and minister and cry out your heart and pour out your heart because it is, that is the value before the Lord. He says, you offered me nothing and she's cleansed my feet with her tears. You gave me no water, but she has wet, wet my, my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. I can't see very well because my eyes are blurry. You have, you have um, oh, sorry, you gave me no kiss, which is also an Eastern custom. You gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came, has not ceased to, to kiss my feet. Such an intimate, uh, such an intimate expression of love. A kiss is is it, it is the most intimate of expressions of love. It is the initial onset of, of intimacy when you, when, between a husband and wife. It is the most intimate beginning introduction. And they do it often in, the, in the other cultures because of affection and regard, and even it is of respect. You did not do this for me. He said, you did not anoint my head with oil, and she has anointed me, my feet, with perfume. This was the third anointing of Jesus. There, there were three others. I don't have time to teach it, but there were three other anointings, but this was in preparation for his burial. And it says, and for this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven her. For she loved much. But she has been forgiven. Oh, I'm sorry. My words are, my, my eyes are not working. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, her your sins have been forgiven. I want to tell you some things. My sins were big. I saved but there were some big sins that I committed. I, did, I, I, didn't, I wanted to be free. I'm so thankful that God saw my heart. And I want to tell you something. That just as I shared with you a few minutes ago, that just as surely as there is a call on your life, the devil sees the call on your life. He doesn't know the end of it, but he can see. He can't see the future, but he can see people that have an anointing on their life. He can see it. And there was a call on my life. And the enemy tried to crush me and kill me. I mean, I can tell you instances where only God saved my life. And he tried to destroy me and take me out. But nevertheless, God still had his hand on me. And, but in the brokenness, the, 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 all that was within me, all those things could have become a bitter root in me. But then instead, they have become a sweet-smelling fragrance because I have learned to pour out my heart like the vessel that was broken. She poured out anointing upon him, 
And it was in preparation for his going to the cross. If you permit Holy Spirit to get after those sore places in your heart and the wounds of your heart and let him go deep within. Even There may be even things that you don't even know that are there, but if you say, I know there's something there that I want it to be broken and give it all to the Lord, it becomes like an anointing before the Lord and a fragrance rather than becoming putrefied in your life. Have you ever smelled flies getting into the anointment, it's putrefied. It becomes defiled. And it, but if we let God deal with the broken things in our life and bring them to him, humbling ourselves before him, much like this woman, with a reckless abandonment, she did not care. And God wants us to have that same reckless abandonment. I looked up the word when that song, Reckless Love, came out. And I thought, how could that be? How could we have reckless love? Because I always think of reckless love as driving the car and it's dangerous. They're dangerous. But reckless means an abandonment, a radical abandonment that not caring. And so God's love for us is reckless. It's reckless love because he does not care what another thinks. He does not care what the world thinks, that the world tries to put on you that you cannot that is a lie. You can. If God has spoken it to your heart, you can be what he says you can be. If he has spoken it, as he has made it happen, you will do that if he has called you to do it. Now, don't say I'm going to be president of the United States. If he hasn't called you to do it, it ain't going to happen. But if he has, who would want that job? Anyway, but if he has called you to it, you can walk in it. For her... She brought her best. She brought the vial, if you will, of alabaster. Broke the seal. She allowed the brokenness, the most precious things. Sometimes it's even your children that you love so much that disappoint. Sometimes it's a, a job promise that never came to pass. Something, it's a hope that you have, but you break the seal and say, Lord, I'm pouring this all out to you. I give this to you with an abandonment. I give this all to you. Ladies, I had a conference a few weeks ago. I had vision for a, a big thing. I knew it was God. I knew it was God. And he said his bride has made herself ready. He led me to the scriptures. So I went and things didn't turn out exactly how I thought it. There was so much. It didn't go the way I thought it was. You know, things in life just don't go the way you really, even good things, even God things don't always go. But we have to trust him even with that. And, and then this conference, and I knew it was coming. And so to set aside the wound and the hurt and not getting it, not hearing his voice, not understanding it. And, and sometimes you have to die to things that are even God-given visions and God-given birth. Sometimes you have to let it go and bring it. The most valuable thing that he has given to you, you have to give it over to him. If it's your marriage that's fallen apart, you have to bring it and give it to him. And I'll tell you this, ladies. Once these women encountered Jesus, they were never the same. And, and God brought them through the sorrows, the loss, the disappointments, the hurts, the things that were so precious to her, to her. She brought it to the Savior and poured it all out. Ladies, don't waste your sorrows on the world. Bring your sorrows to the cross. Bring your sorrows to the Savior. Pour it all out because only He is trustworthy. Only He can take. I've had to die to so many visions, but God, that God gave. God birthed visions, God birthed desires, and bring Him to Him so that He could raise up a more perfect work. In my heart, and perfect love within me. First love for him. And then love for his women. Or his people. 
So uh, we're going to enter into a time of prayer for just a few minutes. I hope that I said all that God wanted me to say. You can trust the Lord with your heart. The things that are most precious. I have to continually bring to the Lord my kids, you know. It's, it's life. They're good. They're, go they're great kids. But, you know, when you get to a certain age and those ladies that are of maturity here, you get to a place in life sometimes that you wonder, where are your kids? You know, where are the people that you invested in? I mean, that's truth. And, and because you want so much more. But then, you know, I know that life is busy and we go on. And that's why the, it's so important to become Anna's, women of prayer. She was a prophetess. She got to see the Savior. Ladies, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The spikenard that is in the vial is pure. Pure oil. And it was so precious, she poured it out at all. What's within you, woman of God, is so precious. You can pour it out to him because he's worth it. He's worth the worship. He's worth the adoration. He's worth the abandonment. Be willing to pay it all. And if you're willing, he will reward you. Her name is written in the book, and we're still talking about her. Amen. Close your eyes, ladies. Ministry team, please come up. It's my heart, Lord. It's my heart that these ladies would know the value and the worth of their womanhood, of their femininity. God, that they would not despise their emotion but keep their emotion in check by the Holy Spirit, that they would not despise their sensitivity or their femininity, but embrace who they are and the call on their life. Even if it is mom, that's everything. Even if it's grandma, that's everything. I love being a grandma. If it's a woman of God or preacher, Lord, we bring these things to you. Ladies, if there's something that you're hanging on to or if there's a hurt, a disappointment, or an unfulfilled dream, come and pour it out to the Savior. Let Him have it all. With an abandonment, give it to Him. I'm moving into something from the Lord. Ilea Women, my love, my love, my love here. My love here, how I love you here. Here how I long for you, says the Lord. I long for that intimate friendship. I long for you to come and to be at my feet. I long for you to rest in my presence and let me lavish you with my love. I long to give you all that I have. I long to comfort you and hold you close. The cares of the world, the troubles that are around, they steal, they kill, they mock, they destroy, they hurt. But I, the Lord, am a comforter. I, the Lord, am a good heavenly father. I, the Lord, am the love of your life. I am the love of your life. Come then, therefore come. Come and wait. Come and pour out. There is nothing so great that I cannot comfort. There is nothing so big that I cannot hold you close and say I love you and I will heal you. There's nothing so great that my kindness is extended, cannot make the difference in your life. Oh, my daughters, I say, receive from me this hour. Receive from my spirit and be comforted. Come now, even now, come. Permit my spirit 
to pour out to you. As you pour out to me all that causes the soreness of your heart, all the worship that you can muster as you pour it out to me, I, the Lord, will meet you. Ladies, come forward for prayer. The women are here if you want to receive, or you could even stay where you are and let Holy Spirit.